and the truth is... I don't trust you. I don't know who you are. I, I don't know what you're doing. You will. Your father does. Yes. Searched every building on campus and the surrounding areas. We can't find her. Good. Welcome everyone to Dead Talk Live. I'm your host Viz from Walking Dead Now, and I want to welcome a very special guest, Aaliyah Royale, who we were all introduced to as Iris Bennett on The Walking Dead World Beyond, the new Walking Dead spinoff series. Aaliyah, thank you so much for being here with us. How are you doing? Oh my god, I am overwhelmed with excitement. I'm I'm ecstatic uh, just to talk to you guys about the show that we've we've had in our pocket for a year now. I know. So I'm just thankful that it's finally out and that everyone can lay their eyes on it. How hard has it been sitting on this for that long? Uh, it was it was definitely difficult. We shot from July to December of last year, and we were set to air in April, and and then due to pandemic concerns, we pushed back. And uh, those moments are hard for me. They're hardest because uh, I have a single mom, and these moments where I'm like, Mom, I'm doing something with my life. My my career is in a it's in a good place. I get to I get to tell her like, hey, you can watch me tonight on this show. I promise, you know, all the sacrifice it was worth it. And and so that getting pushed back made it uh, made it slightly harder to do that. But now that it's finally out, just sharing these moments with my mom are everything to me. And and being a part of this fan base, this is everything. I'm how, so thankful. How proud of she? How proud of? How proud was she of you after she saw Sunday's episode? Explain it to us. So, my mom has probably, I can't even lie, seen the pilot I don't know how many times. Just, I, I couldn't even put a number to it. Like, probably over a hundred times. Wow. But the fact that it had actually aired and she got to share that moment with, like, my family on the East Coast, my family here on the West Coast... She just became that like little country Virginian girl all over again, which is crazy because that's where we shot. Um, it was it was a really big deal. That really is big deal. so awesome to hear. So when you landed the role of Iris Bennett on World Beyond, how did it feel knowing that you were coming in to a spinoff of an established show of ten years? I I don't think I. I don't think I knew what I was getting myself into. <laughs> um, at the time, I was more, it, it came across my desk as like Untitled Walking Dead Project. And I was like, oh, that's cool. There's no way I'm going to get this for the sole reason of the fact that I am deeply terrified of walkers. Oh. Undead scares the lights out of me. So immediately when I got the audition, I was like, I was like, don't even think about it. You're not going to get it. You will never have to see the undead in person. We're going to be okay. And then I got it. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, like what's going to happen? I'm going to die the first night on set. And I think the biggest welcome that I got, like the biggest wake up call I had was last year's um, 2019 New York Comic Con. Uh -huh. We, uh, World Beyond had a panel after The Walking Dead, and The Walking Dead went on, had this insane roar of a welcome, and I was like, wow, wish they didn't go on first. <laughs> <laughs> Follow that up. That's going to be great. Um, and I, I kid you not, as I'm staying, standing in the wings, I'm nervous, and I'm like, what if I don't answer the questions right? What if I say a spoiler? Like, I'm screwed. I go out. The lights come up. The welcome that we got from this audience is truly insane. We didn't even have a title of the show yet. They knew barely nothing about our characters. We were keeping everything very under wraps because of the fact that we were still in the midst of shooting at this point. And just the love in that room, it was, it was nothing I've ever felt this 
like in this world and I knew that world beyond was gonna have a place in the walking dead and I knew that the walking dead franchise was just gonna be a blessing for right. for not my career but just for the fans as well that's amazing now how did you and your fellow castmates did you when you were shooting and you knew the enormity of the franchise you're coming into how did you guys do while shooting did you guys just say you know we can't think about that we got to go out there and do what we need to do what was your guys's you know frame of mind on set it was always just this is so freaking fun <laughs> like our job is so freaking cool um a huge part of our job is like stunts and i swear the first moment that my weapon i call her shiloh she's a horn troll is in my hands and i'm slicing and dicing and doing whatever cool kill that i'm doing it feels amazing it feels it's so like this unreal feeling of like you're a freaking superhero um we just reveled in that all of the time and also we have some 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 characters with some really big secrets and some heavy backstories mm. and the backstories come to life on the road and we're having really serious moments it means everything for us to even just get to cut for one second and nico cracks a joke or nicholas or house does something funny and we're all you know, rolling on the floor laughing in dirt and fake sweat and fake blood. And we just kept that energy the whole way through. It was important that we kept laughing and didn't take ourselves too seriously yeah. or else we think about like, what if the fans don't like us? <laughs> like, what if they don't want another show? What do we do? <laughs> no, no, you guys were excellent. I love the premiere. Uh, now, you said you got the audition. How did that come about? How did that script or how did that audition come across, come your way? Okay, so it it was it was just like another beautiful sunny day in California, and I got the email, and I was like, okay, I guess, like not even thinking much about it. Um, I went in like early in the morning, like 9 a.m. in the morning. Later that day, I was like at lunch with my friends and I got the call that was like, hey, can you be in New York tomorrow? And I was like, yes, <laughs> absolutely, um, for the test. And, and I flew the next day, I was in New York. I barely, I didn't even step foot in the hotel room. I was like on the ground running. Um, it was like several hours of these chemistry reads to read with. Um, Alexa Monsor who plays my sister Hope because she had already been cast and it was it was stressful because a lot of the girls there were like being very buddy buddy with Alexa and very much like oh my god like we're already basically sisters and and all that stuff and I was like okay maybe the key to getting this would be if I wasn't up her ass and that had me like okay I'm just gonna be chill I'm gonna you know say hi and let her know that I'm happy for her that she got the role and, and i'm gonna be the chill sister and every time we did a scene together because there were like rounds of tests every time we went in together it was powerful it was organic it felt natural and i think um it was good that i didn't try too hard because it kept her comfortable uh -huh. which describes our relationship just even on set even like in our first meeting it, it didn't have to be like oh my god what's going on like oh my god we're sisters this is great <laughs> we're like what's up <laughs> she was like, I was like, this will be fine. Like, well, we're going to be great. So how, um, uh, I mean, how long after that audition did you find out that you got the role? I flew back home the next day. And then the next day after that was when I got the call from my, from my manager. Like, hey, you're going to Virginia. You got it. And then I had to figure out, like, what I was going to do about the walkers. <laughs> because I'm on the phone and I'm telling my manager, I'm like, Carla, they scared the shit out of me, please. I don't know what to do. Um, and she was like, you better not say anything until the last day of set. Do not say anything until the shoot wraps about you being a Um And I didn't. And I got through it. And I'm still afraid. But it was it was really cool. Well, was it different? I mean, it has to be different seeing him on TV rather than seeing normal stuntmen dressed up as dead people drinking Coke next to you at the lunch table. You know, you're right. There's okay. That's part of it. Again, again, if it's during the day and you're at lunch, like or at like the catering hall, and they're chilling and they have like iced tea or they're eating a freaking Twizzler, like yeah, this feels natural because they don't have like the mouthpiece in. They're not dripping blood yet. 
but no, at nighttime during a night shoot, when it's three in the morning and you're delirious because you came to work at six and it's three in the morning, no, they look very real. <laughs> we have a great special effects team. There's some very talented, the stunt men, they get really into playing the role. No, it's 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 like a being in an alternate universe. Oh, that sounds fantastic. So now on the world beyond the zombies, the walkers, the undead are called empties, as opposed mm-hmm. to walkers on the main show. Uh, were you guys ever given an explanation, or will we as fans find out as the show progresses how the term empties came about? I think it. I think it's okay. Explain to us. It's the fact of. Um, I don't know. In Michigan, when I I used to live in Michigan because I was a military brat when I was younger, mm-hmm. people called like pop. And yes. I was like, what? Yes. Weird. <laughs> um, and then in the South, people would be like, could you hand me a Coke? And that could mean Sprite, an actual Coke. It could be anything at all. You just say like Coke. So it's, it's kind of that same concept of we're just in another place in the Walking Dead universe. And in this place, we say empties as opposed to walkers. Or um, I think you're going to actually hear them called another term oh, yeah. on the show on on world beyond that's actually probably my favorite way to call them um but the the way that it's thought about on the show is the fact that everyone because we've been living in the apocalypse for 10 years we don't see them as the people that they used to be they're not really these like freshly turned you know people that we used to love it's been this way for 10 years so whoever we loved that was once in there it's they're gone the vessel that they're in it's empty and that's why we call them empties however Iris, Hope, Silas, and Elton, we don't see them that way. We kind of see them as a version of ourselves all the time, which is why it gets really stressful for us to need to protect ourselves against them is because we feel like we're just killing, I guess, a version of what we're going to become one day anyway. Yes, and yes, yes. That's a, that's a weird thing to, to battle. Gotcha. I totally understand that. Now, what was going through Iris's mind When you go and knock on your therapist's door and you see that she had died overnight and turned into a zombie, what was going through Iris's mind at that point? Because it seemed to be a big turning point for her. Actually a really, really hard scene to shoot. Read just reading it, um, in the script when I had gotten it was it was kind of tough. Um I like that Iris presented us with a good idea of not having everything together but trying to work on it Mm -hmm. because i don't mental health means that you are perfectly okay i think it means that you're working on being okay um and so to have that (laughs) to have that stripped away from her was really difficult i mean we we saw in the in the previous scene like dr k is sick you know she's definitely on her way out but i think especially since with the girl's father gone and, and it being monument day and iris already being stressed about the speech Dr. K being there would have been would have been just the mascot that Iris needed. Yeah. So having not having her father, feeling like she doesn't have hope because she can't be honest about these dreams that she's having and in this past that she's held on, held on to for 10 years and now losing Dr. K, Iris has nothing left. And I think that's why it's such a big turning point is because she's like, I don't have anything else to lose and I've lost my mom. I've I've, the people I've actually lost would include my mom and Dr. K. I'm not going to lose my sister and I'm not going to lose my dad. And that's why it's such a strong moment for her. Uh, that is perfectly explained. Uh, so, in your mind, you, you know what I mean? Is it your dad? That's the turning point, getting the news from Dr. Leo Bennett that your dad, he's in trouble, his life's at risk. Or really, is it Dr. K? Is it, is it the doctor dying? That's your snapping point. That's your turning point. Or is it going to be a combination of both? I I definitely say it's um that that built up you know I'm I'm lying to my sister I've been lying to my sister for like ten years but now I'm really lying to my sister about the dreams of the fact that I'm I think I'm dead yeah. in my dreams um my father I haven't seen him in months don't know what he's doing haven't heard from him and now there's this distress signal of a message that says he's clearly not okay and I feel like there's nothing I can do about it because I'm just a kid um. And then Dr. K was like, she was like that, like little tiny straw breaking the camel's back. Um, 
it just it took it took me over my over my breaking point and at that point I'm I think I was in mourning and I was in shock for a very long time and I think the moment that I realized I was at my breaking point was when I when I turned to Elizabeth and I'm like yo I, I don't trust you and that, and that brings us to the next question at that speech uh, after that speech when you turned to Julia and you Elizabeth and you said to her I don't trust you we see a complete role reversal between you and your sister hope okay through the first part of that episode it's hope that is saying we need to do something this is not right i don't trust them uh iris is the one saying we got to keep the peace they're you know they're protecting us you know whatever and that moment after the speech we see a reversal you're like we got to go after dad we got to go help dad and then hope becomes the one that says um how we can't do anything um do you think iris's plan to step out of those walls the safety of those walls at the colony came from courage or just being completely naive of what's waiting for you guys out there courage or even i you know what i don't think it's either of those i would say it's having no other options okay. she has other options here's here's the here's the way that as iris that i was looking at it so i'm never gonna become a person in this community that's just it i can take on any role i need to i will be the tutor i'm class president i'll give the monument day speeches i will set up any anything that you need like i i'm i will take on that role i'm that person and by being everything else i am nothing to myself mm -hmm. i can't even be a sister you know what i mean i don't know what i would even look like if i if i really if you guys saw my my relationship with my father what that looks like for me to be a daughter i don't even know that iris could could do that the literal only way for her to become a person is to leave this community and she's never ever going to do that without her sister by her side because hope is Iris's hope. That's my rock, my ride or die. Even if we disagree on everything, the big stuff, you know, we need to come to an agreement on, or else it's, you know, that's that's my heart and soul. Do you um, think? Oh, sorry, go on. No, no, please. Do you think the thought ever crossed Iris's mind that I may lose my sister out there? Uh, Elliot uh, could die. Uh, Celius could die. Uh, the danger I'm putting these other, you know, friends of mine in, it seemed to me watching the episode, that thought never crossed your mind. And that's why I used the word naive as to what awaits you guys out there. So do you... I think... No, go on. I think... Um, Iris never planned on Elton or Silas going. She was like, I'm going to go. And I know that I would do better with my sister along. And I know that we're better together. Whether one stayed here and the other left or both were in different locations, we're better together, whether that's on the road or in the community. And I'd rather just be on the road with my sister. And and the truth is, we should both be going to get dad. It's not just about us becoming who we want to be. Uh, the initial idea is we need to save our father. Yeah. And, and we can't do that without each other. We we fill in the blanks for each other. So when Elton and Silas are like, hey, we're going with you. I think we were so caught up in the, in the ambition of it all that we're like, okay. I mean, I guess this is fine. But when you think about it, like Elton doesn't have anything left there. Mm -hmm. You know, all he has is his memories of his mom <laughs> and and the little sister that he hasn't had yet like that's that's what he thinks is out there waiting for him and what he wants to find and he he should be able to go find that and then silas silas came to the community with nothing as well it's just this reputation of being some sort of criminal some sort of monster and he should be able to run like outlive that too and not have that be his entire identity yeah he, so, he felt like he never belonged there yeah for for elton he has he still has work to do and for silas um he has no identity there so he is free to become whoever he wants whenever he wants he doesn't have anyone um that's like i i I, I can't go for this person or I have these ties or these strings back home. He doesn't have a home. He's a wandering soul. So the four of us being on the road, it makes sense. And it feels really good to get out of those campus colony walls and be a person. 
I, I, I totally agree, especially uh, how the episode ended. Uh, what did you think about that plot twist in the script with Elliot's mom and your mom? I mean, when you read that, you're like, wow, my mom did this to your mom and my little and my sister did this to your mom. I mean, I, I don't even know how that's going to come out. I know it will at some point. But man, uh, they're just building up to it. But what were your thoughts when you read that? I saw it as, damn, Hope is a savage from a young age. Like, this girl is a savage. Do not mess with her. Um, Just her, she can problem solve very just efficiently from a young age. But between my mom and Elton's mom, first of all, Elton's mom is, is just... I have to chalk it up to just just the fear of oh, yeah. the night the sky fell, oh, which yeah. is you know, what we call everything. Um, the night that the sky fell, none of us knew what we were doing, and I can't imagine you know not being able to find my husband or my son and literally carrying another child. And then this woman is coming at me, and I don't know if she's been bitten or is infected by mm-hmm. whatever the hell is crawling around out here. Um, I totally understand how how. You know, she could be holding that weapon to protect herself and not realize that it can also hurt someone else. Uh, so, yeah, you know, Iris has no idea about how her mom actually died. She thinks that she was eaten by empties and that Hope saw her get eaten by empties. And that's just not what happened. So I think Iris is safe right now. It's just the guilt of the only reason that happened is because as we were running and trying to find safety iris let go of hope's hand out of out of like fear for whatever she had seen and she like ran in the opposite direction yeah and it she she's carried that for 10 years that's the reason why she will do anything for anyone and and Mm -hmm. help out the way that she can is because she feels like she just did not do enough that night and that the reason her mom died is because she was afraid so i think the other side of her leaving this community is her alternate way of saving her mom's life. Like, I'm not afraid anymore. Gotcha. Now, when you read that script, did they specify in the script, I know they specify in script step by step, Hope shoots mother because of explosion in the background, not intentionally. Did they, was that written in the script or was it written that just Hope, young Hope shoots mother? You know what's, funny what i'm trying to remember i'm trying to remember like seeing that scene um i again i've seen the pilot i don't know how many times and i did not remember there being an explosion the same (laughs) exact time there is there's an explosion right behind her which sort of leads it led me to believe that yeah hope was aiming the gun at this woman but the reason why she fired it is because she was startled by an explosion that takes place right behind her. Right. Yeah. yeah. That makes perfect sense. During that scene, I'm not joking, I'm always like looking at the intensity on, on Young Hope's face. I can't remember the actress's name, but she is extremely talented. And I love seeing her um on like all throughout the season. But yeah, that um I definitely say that that's a way that someone would end up pulling a trigger by accident is if they're startled by Yeah. Just anything that's happening around them the night that the sky fell. Um, I, I don't actually remember how it was written. Scenes like that be so that I don't remember them when I'm playing. For example, that that moment where she's like, I'm glad you didn't have to see any, see it, Iris. I'm glad you didn't have to see any of it. So that when I'm in that scene, I'm not thinking about the fact that they're going to flash back to the moment Hope pulled the trigger. Mm-hmm. I won't read too much into the scene. Okay. Is that your or preference or is that what they give you? They don't give that to you? Or is that your way of... Uh... It's definitely there in the full script. We, we get every bit of the information. It's just if it's not a scene that I'm in, I won't... Um, like, I'll, I'll be like, oh, I wonder what this is about. But I won't read it in, in full detail just so that while I'm playing Iris, I'm not thinking about the information that I already have. Oh. Uh, it's just best that way only because there's a lot of, like... There's a lot of plot twists and secrets on this show, and there's there's sometimes like several in an episode. And if you know them while you're playing, 
like the character it can it can kind of take you out of it and you can like you you might like cut and be like no i feel like i feel like i was foreshadowing in that can i redo it again um there were literally times where one giant secret was revealed like in the in the later episodes and we were just messing around as a cast and we had, we were shooting the scene that of us like not knowing about the secret because the secret is in the episode that we're going to shoot next uh-huh. and we cut and all of us are like damn this is hard because we know the truth like this is man this is tricky like <laughs> it was it's just it's crazy because you'll cut and be like damn i know exactly what you did um so that's why it's just best to to kind of like know every single part of your scenes um of course but just anything that has any other like any other characters secrets or backstories i leave it to them so that when iris finds out or maybe iris doesn't find out it it's organic and it doesn't feel like i'm trying to pretend i don't know something that's genius that's a genius way of doing it well, that's my opinion i think that's awesome you keep this you keep the scene authentic by doing it that way the walking dead is known for having some crazy ass plot twists oh yeah and- when you when you like love these characters and you find something like that out you're like ah oh, shit <laughs> when does my character find out and they're like they don't find out till like i don't know season 2 episode 1 and you're like damn you want me to hold on to this information like the whole season damn so yeah it's best just to not know okay. don't worry. All right, now let's move on. In the episode, we hear about the Omaha and the Portland colonies, mentioned several times. Um, Are those two colonies oblivious that there is a third colony that is controlled by the CRM? Um, Okay, so we are Omaha. Campus colony where we live um, in the beginning of the series is in Omaha. And then we're in great community. It, the okay, so the three rings, like on the helicopter that Rick gets famously carried out of, it's the three rings symbolize Omaha, Portland, and the Civic Republic. Oh. So we're all in great communication with each other. You know, we're all self-sustaining communities um, that have found a way to survive and and th- honestly thrive. We have food, water, energy. We're doing great. Um, which is why it's called the Alliance of the, of the Three. But the Civic Republic has way more resources and water, energy, food than than we could even imagine having. We we know where we are. We know yeah. where uh, Portland is. We have no idea where the Civic Republic is. Um, they're just this overhead organization that's extremely secretive. You know, we put our father on loan to them and haven't heard from him since. You know, it's it's a it's a really sketchy situation for, you know, Portland and Omaha to be very open in communication. And we have to just trust that the Civic Republic is doing what's best for now, us. Now, is the CRM providing protection for the Omaha colony? We have our own security, which is why you see um, when Doc- Felix. Yeah, he's head of our our security. Yeah, when you see Doctor K being carried out, it's by members of uh, our security, I, I believe. But um, no, seeing that, I like. I think that's one of the first times that Iris really sees the CRM, which is why she's like bowing towards them and hello, good day, sir. Um, yeah. That's great news because I'll, up until now, I was under the impression that the three rings symbolized three separate colonies, not the two colonies and the CRM. Uh, every, I mean, there was a whole bunch of articles that came out that they talked about three different locations. And the third location, everybody's been theorizing it's where Rick Grimes was taken to. But you explaining it, Portland, Omaha, and the third ring being the CRM, now, that's information okay. as far as what the CRM has given your colony, correct? Right. That is what I think. Okay. So now it gets a little tricky. That is what, like, in Iris's headspace, this is, like, what it looks like to her. This is what's happening here. We've got Omaha. Like, that alliance of the three, it's Omaha, Portland, and the Civic Republic. Uh, I don't know that... The Civic Republic sees it that way, <laughs> and that's that's why um, it gets tricky 
he, <laughs> there's our side of the story and then there's their side of the yeah, story that they yeah. to not share with us gotcha i gotcha now the first but, message that we see come through from uh your dad uh dr leo bennett are we to assume that is this the first message you guys have ever gotten from your dad since it's been put on loan to the crm um i would say not the first message but it's one of the the i think we were in good communication for a minute and then we didn't hear from him for for months and th these are the first messages that we're seeing from him since not having heard from him in a, in a really long time which is why we're thinking he's just really busy you know because yeah. at this point we're supposed to trust that the civic republic is who they say are they yeah, are he's out there trying to save the world He's, you know, one of the leading scientists in immunology, yeah. you know, and that's what you need to figure out the cure, right? Yeah. We're thinking he's saving our lives right now. At and least what the CRM told you. That's that's at least what we think the, the CR is doing, yeah. Uh, now, Iris made a very interesting uh, statement that caught my ear uh, when you were pitching your idea to hope to go outside the walls. Hope asks you, what will we do when we get there? Iris's response is, we will be different when we get there. It was very short, very quick, but it really caught my ear. And that led me to believe that there is some part of Iris's thinking that knows that whatever Iris, Hope, Elliot, and Celia encounter out there, it may change you forever. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, the, the will be different, will be ready. It has to do with, um, I know for Iris, it has to do with not being afraid. Oh, okay. That's what the biggest thing was, was, you know, we'll be different. We won't be scared little kids. We're, we're going to be able to make a choice, make choices. We're going to be adults and, and we're going to be strong and, and we're going to be everything that we weren't the night that the sky fell. Whoever, whatever happened that night, I know that for Hope, although I don't know the details of it, I just, you know, think that she saw this really horrific encounter. Um, I know that it's changed her. Uh -huh. and that, you know, she she's a person that is, is trying really hard to, to be okay. And I'm saying that we'll be different on the road. We will be okay because we'll have each other. Well, and thank, we'll be you. thank you for explaining that. Uh, now, Julia Ormont, uh brilliant Emmy-winning actress. Uh, her character, Elizabeth, is fascinating. I didn't, I never trusted her in the episode, uh, but she did manipulate Iris and Hope into leaving the campus by giving you that map of New York State. Uh, and, of course, we saw the slaughter of your colony at the end, which, again, leads me to believe she wanted you guys out there. Uh, she did not give you that map out of the kindness of her heart. I'm not going to ask you to reveal any spoilers because I know you can't. But I just wanted to put that out there. My question to you is, what was it like worth working with uh, Julia? <gasps> She's amazing. And every <laughs> she, um, there were sometimes I didn't understand certain choices um, in the scenes. I like just certain things like didn't make sense to me, and I ask her like what she thought about it and she would explain to me and explain it just she she brings the story to life and she really helped me just be better as like an actor and just in iris's headspace uh iris's relationship with elizabeth is probably um inadvertently like a really strong relationship that she has only because her the feelings that Elizabeth provokes out of Iris are very strong. You know, she wants to trust and she wants to believe that her father is okay. But, we, you know, we're talking about these alliances and, and how we're okay. And and, and then <laughs> it just doesn't add up. It just yeah. doesn't make sense. You know, the more I hear my, my sister talk about how this does not add up, I'm thinking like, I'm I'm filling in the blanks myself. I don't have answers from Elizabeth. None of us do. We we this is our first time like really seeing her and and encountering her, um, or anybody in in these like intimidating CRM suits. So it's a it's a big deal to just be in in this space with her. But Elizabeth is a uh, she's a, she's a force of nature, and she comes across very much like about her business. And I think as the season goes on, we're gonna see if if 
the things that the CR is doing? Is it is it for you know bringing the world back to what it was? Is it for the cure, or is it for a whole other reason yeah. altogether? And for me, uh, I did not trust her throughout the entire episode, but at the <laughs> end, when she said, you know, good, when she found out you were not part of the dead. Uh, I really am questioning. I don't know. I don't know. Is Elizabeth good? Is she bad? What's she up to? I know you can't say, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Uh, let's take a, qu- a question from a, a viewer. This comes from AZ Gamer from Instagram. At the end of the premiere, Iris and her crew set out on a new journey, have, having never been beyond the walls of their community. What are you most looking forward to as we prepare to walk into a whole new world? Mm-hmm. I know it's not walkers. <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't understand, okay? You Okay, after seeing the walkers on The Walking Dead and on Fear, you're like, what else could they come up with? We've seen some really crazy shit. Mm-hmm. Well, they come up with even crazier stuff, okay? Our special effects team is legitimately next level, incredible, and... Some of the walkers on there will just make my skin crawl to even think about. There were moments where I thought, oh, this is like a prop. And no, it was a real ass person. Or I'm thinking, oh, this isn't a person. And it's just a prop, but it's that real. And it's just decaying and decrepit. It, it was it was crazy. But um, for just playing Iris, my favorite episode, I think, from this season has to be episode four. Okay. Um, there were a lot of, uh, there were growing up for the fact of being just so work oriented and, and really wanting to get into a good place in my career. So, um, my school life is very different than other, than what other, other people had and just even my personal life. So I, I identify with Iris in that way. And episode four gives us both something that we just completely missed out on. And it's a it's a really powerful episode to see you know what Iris thinks her life should have looked like. Well, I'm looking or forward to it. I'm looking very much forward to it. Do you, now, I assume you watch uh, at least on and off the original Walking Dead, the show. Okay. Now, is there a particular character or actor that you used as inspiration when you played Iris? Iris from the original show. Mm-hmm. Mm, Carol, Michonne, gotcha. just uh, the really like fierce, um, strong, uh, even if it's like, I think Michonne has that like fierce and then Carol has that, you know, she's also has her first moments, but she, she has that, um, quiet strength where, where, you know, her presence on the screen is just, we're, we're good. We're going to yeah. be okay. You know, I, right. I, uh, I actually spent some time thinking about this after I watched the premiere because I knew we were going to talk tonight. And uh, I, I'm like, you know, you may disagree with this, but uh, Iris's character to me reminded me the most of Beth on the original on The Walking Dead. Beth. Uh, tell me why. Okay, I'll explain it. Beth started out um, naive to the world like her dad herschel believed that the dead were just sick could be cured she uh was mentally unstable not that iris was mental but she was <laughs> keeping secrets she was having nightmares beth tried to kill herself and up to season five of the walking dead we see her develop into her own which i am i know you can't say but i am sure that before it is all said and done on the world beyond uh, Iris is going to be like one kick-ass, badass, Carol-like character. The Iris that we got to meet Sunday is not going to be the same Iris we're going to see when the world beyond ends, you know, after its limited two-season run, um, assuming you survive, <laughs> which I hope, I hope you do. I hope you do, but this is The Walking Dead, and... Uh, know what to expect i know i know um but you know yeah i'd, I'd actually i'd say that's actually very accurate I'm, i think i might use that mm-hmm. when people say it's like from now on um i think iris takes a little bit from everyone i mean she even has like rick's 
leadership style um, in the way that she wants to keep everyone safe, but will definitely take some serious risks when it's necessary. Um, and even sometimes ex- just execute them herself. Uh, oh. There's there's a lot of, I think Iris is, is a little bit of, you can see a bunch of like several original characters in her. Um, but I, I like that there isn't a comic book for, you know, world beyond mm-hmm. because then we don't have to live up to this, to this idea of, um, you know, a character that, that has already been played for us, that, that people have already fallen in love with the fact that, you know, we don't have a layout, an, an outline or an idea of who these characters are supposed to be. It gave us really good free reign to just be ourselves. Um, and, and, and be strong in, in the new identity of world beyond because it's it's hard to be like do we fit in the Walking Dead universe we're a much younger you know cast uh, it's a, it's shot differently it, we you know we move through this world differently um, but I think I think I've learned you know world beyond is significant mm-hmm. and we definitely deserve to to be here and I'm, I'm really proud of the show in that way you guys are so important I mean uh, you guys are the big lead in into these movies we're going to get with rick rhymes so the world beyond is huge now the last scene in the episode with iris she insists that it has to be her to take out the walker that you guys encounter on the street we don't see you doing it was that uh scene filmed of you killing that walker just got cut or you guys never shot it I think you should watch episode two. Okay. That's okay. 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 <laughs> huh? No. Um, look, 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 look. I can only tell you guys what is in Iris's head, you know, in that moment between like the alliance of the three and, you know, we're all together and, and, and what she thinks these things mean in, in her community between like the three rings and and uh, Elizabeth and how she plans on slicing and dicing her first walker, I I think it's important to note that she only theoretically has learned how to protect herself against a walker or empty. It's a very very different thing when you are outside of the classroom and actually have to execute that. So. Let's just be very kind towards Iris episode two. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I can imagine how that's gonna go. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you guys were all trained by Felix, right? I mean, yeah, Felix. I, I definitely say um, was an instructor in this. I, I think Huck got a lot of training. No, Huck gave a lot of training to Hope. I we've all taken classes on what to do should we encounter a Walker for okay. whatever reason. It's never going to happen because of the campus colony security. But should we run into any problems? You know, there's definitely classes. It's it's just self um, preservation classes that that you take to. You live in this in this dead world. Gotcha. Here's how to protect yourself. Should you ever actually encounter it? Um, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Now, uh, did you know any of your uh, co-stars uh, previously, or did you all meet when you got on the set, when you were auditioning? Like you said, you met uh, Alexa when you got on the set. And was it awkward at first? You kind of answered this previously. I just want to get clarification. Or did you guys just click right away? I mean, like right away you guys became best of buds. The second I met Alexa, she became the love of my life. That's an easy one. Um, uh, I had to play it cool during during the auditions and not be, you know, too buddy buddy and not seem like I'm, you know, trying to coerce her into giving me the the role. But once we were on the ground shooting, uh, before we even started shooting, when we were just getting to know each other for a week on the ground, we we were inseparable. Then uh, we met Nick. Uh, uh, who had also just been in LA uh, he when we didn't even know it Hal came all the way from Australia and we just were like figuring we were at that we were like trying to figure out all just the the culture differences because uh, he, he he has a lot to say and he's really funny and and yeah Nico Annette we all just came you know conjoined instantly it was effortless that's awesome uh, that's awesome uh, so that was like just easy to always just be laughing with them that's beautiful now uh 
I've spoken to a lot of Walking Dead cast members, and they all speak about the family atmosphere uh, on the set. Uh, Fear, Walking Dead. Was that same family atmosphere uh, brought into the world beyond a brand new show? But we know that Gimple is, you know, was an overall the man and responsible of the whole franchise. Um, and I know Greg Nicotero and Gail Ann Hurd uh, were involved, with, at least with the premiere that we saw this past Sunday. So was that family atmosphere in World Beyond on the set as well? Definitely. Definitely. Like I, like I said, uh, when you're shooting these, when episode one is hope, you know, killing a woman <laughs> at a very young age and, and you have these heavy scenes and just these really like stressful moments for the characters it is important to have that relationship with your castmates with scott with matt negretti our showrunner to just be able to just laugh enjoy each other's company ask dumb questions that we want to know about walkers um and just be a part of the other universes as well as you know live in ours it's a it's walking dead and then having the actual creator of it next to you and being able to be like we want the tea spill it what's the details on this like <laughs> um, as you know we're on a, we're on a show you know we get more insight yeah and, and it's it it was a, it definitely was that family atmosphere awesome they're my now michael codless was a guest of ours several months ago and he told us that he directed several episodes of world beyond what was it like working with Michael? He's <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> okay. So there are the directors who are very just like, I don't know, just artsy and in the universe. And they're just like, this is how I see it. This is how we're going to shoot it. Boom, boom. That's it. Um, and then you have Michael Cudlitz, who is a man of the people. First of all, be because of, you know, Abraham and, and being on The Walking Dead, he had... He knows what it's like to be in this universe already. Oh, yeah. So it, we're having a director who has no idea what we're doing or, or no idea what, it, what it's like to be in this undead world. Like he was just very organic and easy. And once again, I just have to say it. He was effortless. It was effortless working with him. Uh, it just it felt good. And every, every time he got to direct an episode, I always had a blast. There's a picture of us for one day he came to work literally like matching i i feel like it was accidental but i feel like subconsciously like it was on purpose he was literally matching my outfit he did it again with hal he ended up i think matching hal's outfit um he's just he's good at at knowing the universe at telling us exactly you know what looks good on camera which way to move um and also what I, which i think is really important he's big on collaboration he lets us be our characters and you know he guides us along the way and, and he'll point out different factors and he'll, and he'll be like give, give me that like this again i loved when you did that um he's supportive and he encourages us to to trust our insiders um he's a great and i guy. love that yeah he's a great guy he's a great guy there's no other way to put it michael codlitz is an amazing man now world beyond was filmed in the state in which I currently live in, Virginia. Just you guys, you guys just filmed two hours south of me in Richmond. How did my state capital receive you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, everyone knew that we were there. Like everybody. Well, can um, I say, as a resident of Virginia, we were told you guys were coming way before you started shooting. Probably no when, the, yeah. Probably when the deal was signed, this was a while ago, we were told, everyone in the state was told, The Walking Dead is coming to Virginia. I didn't know that. That probably explains several things, like just checking into to the hotel, um, just everything, everyone just being like, The Walking Dead. Walking Dead, yeah, I, I auditioned to be a walker on that. Um, if we had like an Uber driver, they also ended up auditioning to be a walker. I remember going back to, to production and being like, hey, so like people keep stopping me and telling me they auditioned to be a walker on the show. And I think someone was like, yeah, we had like 8,000 people come to audition. And I was like, on this, sh for uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, like that's, 
before that's crazy like which is just another look into into the the fan base um yeah i everybody on the ground knew that we were there if we went anywhere like as a cast we were easily recognizable um which was it was weird because it was kind of getting like a glimpse of what our lives might look like you know post the show airing and then going back to la and like no one knew what was happening at all. I, I think the biggest thing that happened in Virginia was when we were shooting in Hopewell and we had, you know, crashed the plane the night that the sky fell and there's pieces of plane everywhere and the, and these helicopters were just circling and, 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 and we saw later like on the news, people who are in crew or whoever who knew us would show us this footage that was like, y'all were on the news last night. Like <laughs> we have the plane crash on the news and we're like, yeah, I guess if you land a plane in the middle of nowhere, that might, you know, cause some stir up. It's so it's so ironic. The original Walking Dead is shot in Georgia, but theoretically takes place in Virginia. World Beyond theoretically takes place in Omaha, but it's shot in Virginia. <laughs> it's just the whole irony in the whole thing. Now, uh, <laughs> are you guys coming back to Richmond for season two? Um. I wonder if we are. I feel like I haven't heard anything other than that. I'm I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, right now we're we're you know we've got the writers' room up and we're doing incredible things there. Season two is already just incredible, crazy, and just even more badass. But you um, don't know yeah. when you guys are going back to filming again. Mm, it's tricky timing. It's tricky timing, but I, I'll tell you, we're going back soon. Okay. Let's, okay. That's good enough. That's good enough. So when you woke <laughs> up this Monday uh, after the premiere, did your world change? Did my world change? Well, let me put it to you. <laughs> let me put it to you this way, okay? When I when we got you confirmed to be on today, uh, I told everybody that when when Aaliyah wakes up Monday morning, she's going to be a star. And you are. You're a star. So did the world change for you when you got up Monday morning? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. It was, it was, you know, I woke up and I was like, the show aired. Like the first episode is already out there. Oh my God. And then I was like, wait a minute. There's like nine more weeks of this. <laughs> like it only increases. The storyline only gets crazier. The questions that are about to pop up in regards to the Civic Republic and Iris and Hope. It, it is about to be insane. I, I, you know, I'm just happy to have these moments with my mom again. I... My mom is my best friend, my biggest supporter, the actual love of my life. And it's weird when I when I wake up and I, I come in a room and she's like listening to an interview I did or she's like watching something and I either hear Iris's voice or, or I see my face and it's she's like, look at my daughter. And I'm like, yeah, I'm right here in case you wanted to just talk to me. Um, it's it's definitely it's a switch. OK, I mean, that is so cool. Now, you're. 20 years old um but you've been acting for tw uh, for eight years what made you get into acting at the age of 12 and what inspired you at 12 to get into acting i i think i think from like i i've always been in stage plays uh you know uh, stage productions at like the ymca or whatever nearby um school plays that that was that was me i anytime i could pick up a script even if it was 101 dalmatians or three little pigs i was in it i was doing it um i think when i was 11 i went to my mom and i was like hey i might actually be good at this like on a professional level let's move to la and i always say she was kissed by an angel that night because we moved to la she wow. moved to her 11 year old daughter's dream and again the reason why these moments mean everything to me is because i was an extra i was doing background for like two three years when i first started i wasn't making any type of like money like that i was definitely wasn't saying anywhere near what a line would look like it didn't say a line i was barely visible in the camera like she to show for you know this big sacrifice except for her love for her kid and that was really hard for me because just at 11 i had a responsibility that was like 
I need to figure out how to take care of me and my mom. You know, that's what you do. You you get in this industry and you you buy your mom a house. Like, how, how am I going to do that? Um, and she stood by me this entire time. And, you know, there's moments where she's like, did you did you really practice for this audition? Like, are you really ready for this? Like, do you know the lines? Do you know this? Um, and I'm like, Mom, I got it. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you wonder, like, does she trust that I'm, I'm going to come through on this? Does she trust that I'm really talented enough to be here? Because um, there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of no's before you hear a single yes. And I just, every time I got a no, I felt, I was just like, is my mom losing faith in me? And that, you know, booking... I had booked a pilot pilot way back that I booked uh, CBS is the red line and, and now I'm here on the walking debt like literally the moment the red line like wasn't gonna go any further I was like I don't know what to do and then the next month I'm on the walking dead and you know it's my mom she's right my- there what you just explained coming from a parent is why your mom watched that episode over a hundred times okay that's why she's watched it and she's going to watch it thousands of more and all the rest of them as well <laughs> that's why coming from a parent okay I, I i know exactly where your mom's coming from uh do you have a preference between stage or screen Ooh, that's a hard one see um stage stage is that's a different kind of work ethic. I'm not even, I can't even lie to you. Stage actors are the most talented actors in the business. Uh, you don't get several takes. You literally, whatever you did that night that you're on stage, boom, there it is. You mess up, you better keep going because there's no, you can't pull the curtain down, you can't act like it didn't happen. You're in it and, and you gotta, you gotta kill it. Like you, it's literally one of those like one take, never ending, you know, films that you watch. However, uh, film, I think the intensity of just being close to the camera and, you know, being able to really look into the actor's eyes and, and the different shots that you can do, you know, if they're drinking something and you can pull up to their hand and see, see their hand shaking and, and that says something, yeah. you know, the condensation on the glass just slipping down. There's there's a million things that you can do with, with film and TV um, with, with these cameras that, that you might miss in a in a stage production uh if you're not you know 100 percent zeroed in or if you're in a row a little mm. far back yeah. so I, I think they both have their strengths both you know type of actors especially the actors who can switch and and can you know give that projection on stage and then can also be very we're here you know it's a it's a skill and I, I i definitely one day would love to return to the stage Awesome. Now, we're almost out of time, but I want to do this as the last question. Mm -hmm. What do you say now to 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old girls who look to you as inspiration and look what you have achieved? Uh, Do you feel a sense of uh, responsibility? Are you honored that they look up to you? Uh, How does that make you feel? And how do you respond to a 10, 11, 12-year-old girl who now sees you as their idol. Why am I crying? <laughs> Why am I crying? Um, honestly, like, you got this. I have had a, a very strong sense of maybe not like every specific part of myself, but I had a strong sense of who I wanted to be and in, in the direction that I wanted to go in. And sometimes... Uh, whether it's a guardian or maybe your teacher or um, even someone you love in your in your life, they'll tell you like that's not what you should do or you can't do that or you don't have the skill set for that. And I just really want them to believe like it doesn't matter if you're not saying a single line. It doesn't matter if you're not even visible on camera. You got this and you will be okay. That's and awesome. that like not just acting that applies to any role that you play in your life. You got this. Trust yourself. That's beautiful. And on that note, guys, we are out of time. Aaliyah, this has been an amazing hour. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you. You're you're great. You have such a bright future ahead of you, a bright career. I'm so looking forward to watching the rest of the world beyond this season and next season and to follow you for the rest of your career because you have a bright career ahead of you. 
Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I'm very honored to be watching you on one of my favorite shows and it's been off the world beyond. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Leah, again, thank you so much. Uh, it, it's been great. It's been great. I'll be back on the air again tomorrow night, guys. And always stay walking. As Leah just said, never stop. Always stay walking. Good night, everybody.